It's another beautiful Sunday afternoon. This is Robin Minds. Welcome. My name is Abu Kao Biochendi. Thanks a lot for joining us uh, on the show today. Um, this past week has been very hard for a lot of Nigerians to take it. There's been an orgy of violence across the country. Um, and nobody seems to be spared. Just yesterday, we did get news that uh, a member of the Anambra State was, uh, House of Assembly who was kidnapped uh, a couple of days ago was beheaded with his head left on the streets. We're still not sure about the you know, the authenticity of that. And, you know, we're hearing that the Anambra State governor is trying to reach out and has offered ransoms. A lot seems to be coming in. And, you know, the Kaduna State train issue is still not solved. We still have people in custody there. Virtually every state in this country seems to have some violent story to report. And it's pretty depressing to watch this unfold. But while all of that happened, Mr. President did travel to the United Arab Emirates to condole with the president who lost his life there. And, um, there's a lot of people wondering uh, where does the condolence uh, matter more, especially in a country where, you know, everybody seems to be worried with the elections fast approaching. Unfortunately, elections in Nigeria tend to have violence tied to it. And uh, as it draws closer, people are being very skeptical about how things are going to unfold. But we just want to offer our condolences to all the families who are going through tough times and hope everybody can, you know, Stay through this and it, it, it all ends up peacefully. But speaking of elections, the primary season is upon us. Uh, a couple of states uh, and parties have started their primary elections from today, House of Assembly, House of Representatives and all of that. So we're going to be gearing into that very, very hotly as we approach the big one, the presidential primaries with the deadline of June 3rd for all political parties. We're going to be talking parties, defections, decampings, cross carpeting all of that on the show today. I have here with me Fola Daniel, who's a public analyst. Thanks for being here today. My pleasure. So it's, it's political season, but more importantly, it's primary season. Yeah. And for, I think, this election much more than any other one. People have said that the primaries this year is probably going to be more interesting than the actual elections, <laughs> considering well, yeah. the plethora of candidates we have. A lot of the fourth republic politicians yeah. came of age yeah. in this election, and we have so many of them who are trying to be president. What are your thoughts on how things are unfolding so far, just on a general level? Are you optimistic when you look at the lineup? It's an oxymoron of a situation. Oxymoron because in a situation where you would have thought that people were suffering and it's really difficult for people, it's a hard time for people, then one political party decides to sell its nomination from for as much as 100 million. And you would have thought that that would debar a lot of people from contesting and we're still seeing so many people coming out effortlessly declaring. So that's why I said it's an oxymoron of a situation. You would have thought they didn't have it. Then the other thing is that it's good for democracy when people have the platform and they can feel free to come out and say, I want to be a president, I want to be president. But the other question, which is more important, is why do they want to be president? Do they just want to be president because they think that there's something in presidency that belongs to them? Or because some regions believe that this presidency is our turn? Or there is something that they have to offer the nation? not a region as a whole. So it's good for democracy that a lot of people feel free to contest and they are declaring it's good. But the more important thing is what do they really have to offer. So I'm more worried about what they have to offer than the fact that they are free to contest. But on the overall, it's a good thing for democracy. I want to talk ideology now because it's the one thing that never seems to come into the conversation here in Nigeria. Um, you know, all over the world, you have parties based on ideology. You know, if you're left-leaning, if you're centrist, if you're progressive. We have all of those things in name here, but definitely not in practice. Do you think it's important for parties to have ideologies, especially in a country like this, where ideologies might not necessarily be the issue for Nigerians? We're not necessarily debating conservative or liberal issues here. We just want to get by daily. Are we at the point where ideologies are important? Should we be having that conversation? I'll shock you by saying that we have ideologies. As a nation, the political parties that we have also have ideologies. And the reason I said I'll shock you is that it's not that we don't have ideologies. It's the nature of ideologies that we have that are surprising. It's not the regular kind of ideologies that you find in the United States where you refer to some people as Democrats or Republicans. You see, the truth about Nigerian political parties is that some parties lean towards the West, talking about the Southwest, 
Some parties lean towards the north, talking about the northern part of Nigeria, and some parties lean towards south-south. We all know of a particular party that has been existing for years as only one and will continue to win only a state, at least for, from the look of things, in the east. That's Abga. And they've never been able to win any election outside of that state. Why do you well, think that the, is happening? Not on the governorship level, but I think they've won a few but um, do other you, elections. But you realize that the reason that is happening is because of an ideology. And the ideology is traced back to Odumegu Ojuku. So it's not that we don't have the ideology. Look at APC. Where is it coming from? Although it was not APC, it used to be ACN. At some point, it was Action Congress. And they actually believe in the political ideologies. Well, even, even if it's on their lips, they believe in the political ideology of Chief Obafemi Olaw. It's PDP that I really don't have an idea of what the ideology is about. But the most painful part for most parties, if not all the parties in Nigeria, most times we're constantly talking about tribes, we're talking about religion, we're talking about ethnicity. We're not talking about the issues that really affect Nigeria. We're not talking about who is going to fix the electricity. I read a book two years ago to commemorate the 60th anniversary of Nigeria. And I'm talking about security. And this article that I actually wrote on security is as old as 10 years old. And the issues that were raised 10 years ago are just as though they were written yesterday. So we don't have idea, we don't have parties that are saying, as far as nature is concerned, as far as our thoughts patterns are concerned, this is how we think. We are entrepreneurial in nature. We're, for example, in America, when Democrats come into power, you know that there's likely not going to be any war. But when Republicans come into power, you know that there's a possibility of a war. And they are most so, likely going to sponsor it. So the problem really is that we are more centered on tribes and religion, which is why we're always talking about a Muslim Muslim ticket, a Muslim Christian ticket, or a Southern and a Northerner. So I want to, I, I want to just track back with what you said, because I, I want to be clear on what you mean by, you know, the APC has an ideology yeah. and the PDB might not. Um, you mentioned the Bafamiya all over there, yeah. but this was a part of the APC, which yeah. was the ACN that came in. We had yeah. the CPC, yeah. we had a, big, a, a little bit of Abga in yeah. there, and yeah. the NPDP, as yeah. we were called at the time. I mean, does that, what was the ideology? They said they were progressive. And as they've governed, have you seen the APC being progressive, especially at the federal level, which is supposed to reflect the ideals of the party? I would just say a President Buhari, for example, is governing based on, like you said, Obafemi Awolowo's ideals. Ideology. So what I, again, let me, let me be clear so that it doesn't look like I'm ascribing to them the credits that yeah. I don't think they deserve. They, they tend to be, they claim to share his ideology. And you check all their campaigns, most times when they're going on campaigns, you look at the addressing. Look at the caps that most politicians wear today. Where did it emanate from? It's simply because of Awolowo's dressing. Do you understand? So they try as much as possible to impress us on the grounds that this is what Chief Obafemi Awolowo represents and that we align with that, we believe in it, but I don't see it in them. Now, if you talk about the ideologies of Chief Obafemi Olaw and what he stood for, I believe that if they were going to represent that, then Nigerians would have free education, as would not be on strike. Then anybody who knows Chief Obafemi Olaw, the first thing you know is that he sponsored a lot of people, gave a lot of people free education. Even the people who were actively following him, the likes of Chief Bola Ige, gave a lot of people under him free education. And that was a time when our primary source of income was not even oil. We depended on cocoa and gave people quality education. We depended on cocoa and gave people better quality, not just quality education, better quality than you can get anywhere almost in Africa today. So they actually are claiming to share his ideology, but in reality and in principle, I have not seen it on ground. So is it fair then to say we have more, for want of a better word, sentimental parties than ideological parties? Maybe so, and maybe psychophants. Yeah. And I would say maybe psychophants because, you know, when you appeal to me on the grounds of someone that I respect, I'm most likely going to be, you know, open-hearted towards you just because, for example, I meet you for the first time and you mention someone's name. I say, oh, is that your dad? I know him. And then we start talking. You know that on that ground alone, you're going to let down your guard just because I mentioned someone that you know and I said a few things about him. So Nigerians respect certain people. 
in certain regions. And the moment we mention their names and say these are the people we align with, a lot of people just start following. So I really don't see an ideology in any of our parties in Nigeria, which is very sad. We have another guest uh, who's joining us online in Dikato from Abuja. Thanks a lot for joining us, Indy. Sure, you've been following the conversation, but I want to get your perspective on this because I always hear two sides to this argument. There are people who say, oh, talking especially about the two big major parties, saying the PDP and the APC are one and the same, because we've seen um, a good number of the presidential candidates, for example, in the PDP now have gone and come back from the APC. We have the chairman of the APC right now who was once in the PDP. So it's, it, there's a lot of that happening. So there's people who believe they are one and the same. But there's also people who are in this party who will tell you, no, that they're actually different and try to point out things about internal democracy and all of that. What do you think about, you know, both parties and their ideologies? I, I, would, I would say that um, APC is more socialist. It is, it is everything about APC is about social justice. Um, the Nigerian progression of PDP government the attempt at reducing government growth and then having the private sector get bigger and bigger and then you think clearly what APC ideology is. You're looking at a bigger lot of small lessons of the private sector, and this is what is penetrating to that private sector. So I would say for me, that is the, that is the major difference. You can say, oh, you, you have, this is what you believe in, but this is exactly what you do. Um, or I, I had him say something about um, our laws, you know, Minico and like, and, and this is the thing, we did the camping thing back and forth, because Minico is a sponge away, and he goes to the But the clear difference, very, very clear difference, Anytime PDP is in power, also from the 16 years, we saw more privatizations. We saw more of big business setting up. We saw more Nigerians getting into entrepreneurship. We saw for the first time um, sort of like a growing disinterest in government jobs, government anything, which is what used to be the, the, the order of the day for Nigerians. Wanted to be successful. I come from the middle belt of Nigeria, Kaduna State, known as North, the southern of South like that, and growing up. You know, the only way to stop this, the only path to stop this for us was not you had to take a job with government. For every guy you're living in Abuja, you know what I'm talking about. But at some point in growing up, you began to see people depart from that. You no longer wanted to work with CDN and all of these places. That was the doing of the certain political party. Now we've come back to the point where it's so difficult, so difficult for people to set up business, so difficult for some of these things to happen. We're coming back to bigger government, smaller private sector. I don't okay. know if this is something new. Yes. Sorry, Indy, we're having a bit of a problem with your audio. Uh, we're going to try and rectify that um, and come back to you so that we can have this conversation. But I think I got a bit of what she was saying there. I want to know if you agree with, with her points about, you know, the APC, for example, being, being more socialist leaning and the PDP being more about, you know, open government and or bigger, um, more business oriented. Um, Again, that's why I said, you know, it, it's... It's, it's a principle on the lips, not a yeah. principle in paper. But she's talking about even practicality. Yeah, she's saying yeah, that with the PDP, there was more sort of support for entrepreneurship. I still don't think that APC is actually socialist. Yeah. I, I don't think so. But for example, Aula was a socialist. His approach was let everybody have something, and if everybody gets something, at the end of the day, it's better for all of us. So if you look at today, what exactly is the government, I mean, we have APC and we have some PDP governors. We also had PDP in power and we also had some APC governors. So let's look at those of them who have been in power at some point. What exactly can you say is the clear demarcation from the parties? What are they doing differently? I really can't say particularly, except if we now say, let's compare the performance of the governors and use the basis of the performance to judge what their ideologies are. Then we can pick maybe the Lagos state trend and compare to maybe some governors in the Southeast or in the South South who have been PDP for a while. So in Lagos, you would see industrialization, which is not actually the habit of socialists. It's a capitalist mentality. And then the taxes, they, look at what happened under Governor Fashola, for example. They needed to make a lot of money because even from the days of Governor Tinubu, what happened at the time? They weren't getting federal allocation and they needed to get a lot of money. His approach was to make sure that they work on the, taxes, uh, the tax system of Lagos State and then they introduced more taxes, even though they were doing stuff for the society, but we were paying for it. We weren't getting it for free. The bus system that came into place, it wasn't a free stuff. We were paying for it. So they introduced something that looks good to the society, but it was self-sustained even by what the society was paying for it. That's not socialism. That's capitalism. 
So, so in principle, they are not capitalists, but they make it look like, so on, on their lips, they've given you the impression that we are for the people, we like you, we do things for you, but are you not paying for it? Is it not coming from any, the taxpayer's money? Have you noticed money? any difference, though, on a federal level in the way both parties have governed? On the federal level, I wouldn't say yes. Say, for example, under President Gulag Jonathan, we had UWIN, which was a grant for young people. Under this administration, we have NPOWER. Under the President Jonathan, we had an arrangement trying to uh, work on industrialization, although for them, they didn't actually work more on roads. We heard about it and stuff like that, but it didn't happen. Under this administration, we had more on roads. Under the previous administration, security wasn't this bad. It was starting to get out of hand, but it wasn't this bad. But in this, so I, I, I can't really say that the ideology was something that stood out so well. And again, it's difficult because a lot of people have also crossed. So it, I really don't see the ideology. Very true, because sometimes I wonder we have so many governors who, even while still in office, have moved across. And you wonder, okay, so where do you draw the line? You know, what? Should voters be looking out for then as the elections are coming? Yeah. Um, do parties still matter? Because I think I read an article, an international article a while ago. I can't remember what exactly it was. But it said something along the lines of even though we have two parties in Nigeria, it's literally a one-party state because it's, all of these guys are on a straight trajectory depending on who's in power. Yeah, so Is it important can... to look at parties still? Yeah, so quickly, we, we may not be looking at parties, and I've never been an advocate of looking for parties as far as Nigeria is concerned. In America, they basically have two-party system too. Though on paper, it is not a two-party state. So what happens is you see Democrats, you see uh, Republicans, and you see those who are say, saying, okay. I'm an independent and stuff like that. But really, on paper, they are, they are not. So for Nigeria, look out for individuals who have the vision. Okay. I think we haven't decato back. Hopefully, our audio is a little better. D, I don't know if you heard my last question. Do you think we're still going to be looking at parties in the coming election, or do you think individuals trump parties because of this belief that they are both uh, one and the same? We're seeing uh, a new generation of voters. <laughs> I'm sure you've been seeing what has been happening on social media. And yesterday, yesterday was very exemplary. I don't know if I'm allowed to mention the candidate, but it, it, yesterday showed that it transcends social media. When you say, oh, young people, you're just talking on social media. But yesterday showed that, look, people can actually believe in the candidate and take to the streets for that candidate. Campaign with no money for that candidate. It's happening. So we see young people even threatening political parties as we speak. But if you do not give us the candidate that we prefer, we're not going to vote for you. We're going to defer back to voter apathy. So it's actually happening. This is a particular election. Even where I come from, Southern Kaduna's senatorial zone, many people have been voting a particular party religiously, sometimes as protest votes. And for the first time, you see a lot of them saying, look, this time around, if you do not give us candidates that are viable, we're just either going to not vote or we'll go to other parties and vote. And I think this is the beginning of these kinds of things to come in subsequent elections. So we're seeing that now. We're seeing it growing. We're seeing a new generation of voters. Gen Z are putting their foot into the whole thing really well right now. And that is a whole generation of, I don't even know how to describe those people. But however, you can see that, look, oh, they're, they're on his action. Like, they back it up. They back what they say up. And we're seeing them. They are, they are campaigning. They are putting out posters for their preferred candidates. They are saying repeatedly, repeatedly that, look, the party this candidate is running, running under is not our cup of tea. But if this candidate gets the ticket under this party, the party becomes our cup of tea. So we're seeing that happening. However, we still have traditional voters and those traditional party system people, people at the grassroots who have been doing things a certain way. But again, Gen Z is not part of that. Even us millennials, some of us are even bending towards the Gen Z side. So I think that as we're going right now, it's really going to be less about party. There are people who, once they see an umbrella or once they see broom, they are going to be voting like that. But for the first time, Ebuka, you can see an election where you cannot really tell who the president is going to be. And it's something. It says something. You can't really say, oh, oh, see, if this person gets this, you can't draw a straight map from one person to presidency right now, via party or anywhere. And it's really telling. This is one election that so much is going to happen. And I, I want to point out, I want to point out that after the primaries, this is where it gets really dramatic. After the primaries, there's like eight months, between six and eight months till the elections. So much can happen between those, uh, you know, within that period. So much can happen. This is the first time that they are going to have to campaign for months and months on end. So many things are going to decide. So it's, I don't think it's just going to be, oh, this political party, we're going with this political party, whether or not. I think people are really tired at this point. 
All right. Uh, just, I, I got your point there, but just to be clear on you now, because you talked about the candidates who people talked about yesterday. Um, I'm guessing you're talking about Peter Obi. If you, for example, hypothetically speaking, were supporting a candidate in the PDP with all your heart, and they decide to run under the flag of the APC, would you still vote for them? No, I, I, I like to hold grudges, Yabuka. I like to hold grudges. The APC has put me through hell in the majority of no my matter life. Then. Uh, I do not think that I've... Yes, so the, the, answer is, the answer is definitely no. I said, I so parties still matter then? Not please me. Let me... In that, where, what I will refuse to vote for, yes. But what I would decide to vote for, party doesn't really matter. But what I would say no, what people will say no to, differs from what people will say yes to. So in terms of protest votes, this party is going to answer it for me. But in terms of, oh, okay, whether or not religiously, if you're not going to do the right thing, I'm going to vote for a particular party. I can't really say that parties won't matter. Okay. Thank you very much, Indicator. Thank you very much, Fala Daniel. I mean... We have to continue. This conversation is going to go on all year, let's be honest, because um, like you said, I totally agree with you. It's a very exciting primary season. There's so much happening. For the first time in a very long time, nobody seems to know who the candidates of either party is going to be. I've seen all sorts of permutations, but it's all speculation. We're going to be watching very closely in the coming weeks. Thanks for being here today. We'll take a break now. I'll be right back. Please stay with us. All right, welcome back. We're going to switch our conversation now, talking about the Naira. <sighs> That's a very heavy topic for a lot of us. Um, whether you use the dollar or not or travel anywhere, the effects are felt in everything. If you've gone to the markets any time in the last couple of months, you definitely have seen the constant rise in prices of just goods and services. And, you know, a lot of it is tied back to what's happening with our currency. I have here with me Shane Wido, who is a financial analyst. Thanks for being here today. What is going on? I woke up today and I think I saw 610 naira in the, in the black markets or in the parallel markets, whatever I would like to call it, because there's so many you know, markets now for a dollar. And it's something I don't know that anybody ever really envisioned, even two years ago, yeah. that we're ever going to get here. And we always say that everything in Nigeria goes up but never comes down. Where are we headed? I've heard we're going to get to 1,000 probably for the end of the year. I've heard all of these stories because, you know, we are not necessarily exporting anything. Yeah. We're not necessarily, the elections is, is in season, and we hear that when elections is in season, circulation of money is weird, and it affects everything. What's going on? Wow. It's, a, it's really a vicious cycle, and um, I, I think um, what we're just facing now is um, high high demand of this forex interfacing with um, shrinking supply side of markets right so and um, if you have situations like this what you get to to see is the simple major economics that when you have such high demand the prices seems to be so um to be going high, to be going so high and um currently the the, nine, the, the foreign exchange is currently uh, having so much issues in terms of the nigerian economy servicing so much debt. we have we have elections coming coming ahead of us. So right now, um, we don't even know how it will continue to be. And so if we have this demand and we don't have the supply base to, to match up with the demand, definitely this rate is going to get so high on a daily basis. So that's what we currently have now. We also have a guest online, uh, Gospel Lobele, who is an economist. Uh, thank you very much. God bless uh, for joining Gospel. Sorry, I beg your pardon <laughs> for joining us today. Um, <laughs> What's what's Hi, take out of this? Afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. You know, we did hear the central bank governor a couple of, I think about a year or two ago, talk about Aboki FX, which a lot of us thought was a weird analogy to draw and how they were re the reason for all of this going on. That's not in, in the conversation anymore. Now we're hearing about the war in Ukraine. We're hearing about oil prices. There's so much, you know, confusion. Inflation rates is crazy. We're hearing also other side stories about, you know, the constant printing of the Naira for whatever reasons. Are we going even lower in the future, you think? All right, yeah, thank you so much, Evuka, and thank you again. It's great speaking with you again. Um, yeah, we are really, really in a very, very um, tight position, quite honestly. Um, the argument is that the Nigerian economy is recovering. I mean, from the whatever challenge we had, you know, coming from the past, that's the pandemic and all of that. But most importantly, that recovery is coexisting with increasing cost centers. And that's where the main argument is, all right? So um, as we are, in quote and unquote, seemingly having recovery, uh, expensive recovery, inflation is increasing. And 
not just inflation, but the rate of that inflation is worsening, right? So the basket of tomatoes is worsening compared to what it was, you know, a month ago. And Nigerians need to understand that these issues are largely structural than policy driven. So even if the central bank um, has chosen to ban um, uh, Aboki FX. A lot of its languages, you know, from the banning of the crypto access to selling bid, bro, um, uh, current, sorry, to selling FX to broad exchange operators, all of those things have showed clearly that the central bank has not been able to focus on what the major issues are, which in this case are largely structural. So, but then again, it's not the central bank's call to deal with structural issues. With structural issues, we talk about the fact that your markets are not developed. Right. We talk about the fact that we are not harnessing the potential of the non-all space. We talk about the fact that we are not too much of a competitive nation. We don't have the infrastructure to drive national competitiveness and productivity. Until you have productivity and national competitiveness coexisting, the value of your currency cannot really, really be competitive in the long term. All right. Of course, there's also a, a, a conversation around uh, uh, being import dependent and Nigerians having a taste for um, foreign goods and all of that. All of those dynamics are weighing heavily on the demand side. All right. And if you don't have a strong, compelling supply side argument, what would happen is prices will spiral, as Shil mentioned. And these conversations being the fact that they're structural and we're in a pre-election year, I do not think there will be any strategic way forward, at least between now and 2023. So I, I want you to help us understand, you know, the government side of the argument because it constantly contradicts what people are feeling on the streets. You know, they throw out numbers about GDP growth, which you mentioned. You know, we're out of a recession. Yeah. Um, I think the IMF has reviewed even upward, reviewed upwards. You know, the projections for 2022 to about three point something yeah. percent. I'm not sure of the exact number now. So the economy should be doing well. You know, they are throwing all of yeah. these conversations about infrastructure being built across the country. You know, they are working on, the, yeah. they, they don't agree with the poverty numbers. So government seems yeah. to say that they are doing all the right things. Why do you think it's not reflecting? All right, thank you very much for that question. First and foremost, we need to understand that the concept of GDP or GDP growth only talks about economic activities in the country. All right? The fact that you have high economic activities or increasing economic activities doesn't necessarily mean that your currency is better managed. It doesn't necessarily mean that the economy is much more productive. It doesn't necessarily mean that the people in that country or that space where you have increased economic activity are necessarily living better lives or for want of what, you, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a form of improved standard of living. So you can have increased economic activity coexisting with increased cost of living. All right. The cost of living is, is, is we're having that increased cost of living conversation because the structural dynamics that should close the gap between increasing economic activities and improved living standards are not dealt with in this case. So even if infrastructure is bad, you can still have increased economic activity. Even if, um, 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 how would I put it now, education is poor or health is poor, you can still have increased. So GDP growth rates don't really do anything in the sense. It's just a, a how would I put it now, it's just a technical argument or a jargon, all right? It doesn't say anything when it comes to inclusivity or enabling or improving the life of the average Nigerian. The factors or the productivity drivers in this context, if you, if you try to take a measure of those things, you realize that we failed woefully at them, all right? The fact that the average Nigerian gets poorer on a month-on-month basis is a call for worry. And until we deal with the structural issues, we are not going anywhere as a nation, no matter how high our GDP growth rate you know, climbs up to. So we, we need to come back to the key structural questions. And let me also state that the 2022 is a year of what we call political correctness, all right? Being the fact that the elections are at the fore of things and all of that. And what that simply means is that the average Nigerian, in quote, politician or policy stakeholder will be looking at the economy from the lens of what, would, what the political interests are, all right, versus what the real social development interest should be, all right? So that's the argument we have now when it comes to political correctness. And it's so unfortunate that we have that interfacing with a worsening growth decline, all right? And, and, and that's, that's really, really cause for worry for the average Nigeria, and, and it's really, really bad that that's the case. All right, I'll come back to you now. Let me let me throw this to Shell here, because um, when the APC came into power, you know, a lot of the conversation, which they, or the excuses they made, at least, was the fact that under the PDP, especially the Jonathan uh, administration, there was an oil boom, you know, which they had to play with, you know, which, which was why they said a lot of the successes, whatever they were, uh, of the Jonathan administration were recorded. 
so for 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 a while we had the, the the price of oil hovering around the forty to sixty dollar you know price point. Now we're over a hundred dollars for a stretch of time now, but things are getting worse. What is different about this time where we have these oil prices booming and we don't seem to be feeling the effects with inflation, with the way our currency is all over the place, and just the economy in general? Well, I, I think that uh, what is just happening is just a, a deep revelation of what we should have experienced back then. So it's more like we're just being so beclouded by the, um, the influx of the foreign exchange in the Jonathan um, administration. So um, like, um, like I will always say, structurally, we need to fix our non-oil sector. We need to harness the capacity that we have in those sectors uh, in this current regime, because right now um, the oil for, for foreign reserve is no longer um, sustainable for us as we do right now. So we need to address the structural um, deficits in our current economy and um, ensure that those sectors are able to kind of generate forex for us, they're able to export product out. Because this, um, these businesses that we currently have in Nigeria that are currently not, uh, not productive in that sense in terms of exports, they are the ones that the employees of these companies are the ones that actually sufferers of this um, of this of this menace that we currently have now because they are fixed income earners. So the higher the, the foreign exchange is going, the more it is difficult for them to actually survive. And we have in our climb, we have situations where prices of consumer goods are increasing on, on, on a daily basis because the impulse that most of those manufacturers actually requires to, to actually um, um, finish up their product, they are highly imported. So the cost of those, those products becomes so high and you see the cost of consumer, consumer goods getting so high on a daily basis. So what I think is that this administration needs to just focus on that non oil sector and needs the capacity and also empower them to be able to export some of those productions out there. And that will, that will drastically increase the influx of our foreign exchange. So I want to get your opinion, and I'm, I'm also going to get to you, Gospel, on the same thing. Let me start with you. Um, a lot of people have, you know, accuse the current central bank governor of a lot of the reasons why things are the way they are. Yeah. You know, how he's setting policies like he, uh, Gospel had said about, you know, whether it's uh, focusing on the wrong things or having your hands in too many pies or banning the Bureau de Change, you know, or not even necessarily trying to align both the parallel and the official market so that we have one exchange rate, which has been suggested for so long. There seems to be a lot of talk about the policies that the CBN, especially the governor of the CBN, have put out, mm -hmm. which is what's happening to the NARA. But on the other hand, there's also the argument about all the structural things both of you are talking about, which are beyond the CBN. Yeah. You know, so is it really a case of the governor making the wrong decisions? Is that really the issue? Well, if we change the CBN governor today and had someone who had better policies, are things going to change if these structural issues are still there? Well, I think it's not about the, the CBN governor changing some policies. It's more, um, it's an intertwined situation where you have all these pieces of the economy talking to each other. So uh, the CBN governor definitely will focus on monetary and fiscal policies and also ensure that the banks are doing well and all of those things. But um, these policies have a way of uh, affecting the real sector, like I call it, which are the sectors that are actually um, um, they actually pivot out to the growth of the economy. So I don't think um, the CBN governor changing things or making policies will, you know, majorly affect the way we, we see the FX things going. We need to focus on good governance because that's not what the CBN governor would definitely do. We need to also focus on, you know, reducing wastage in that sense and also, you know, building an enabling environment for businesses to thrive. You know, so that's, those are the kind of things we need to look at. Yeah. How people can actually pay, pay their taxes without being bothered with oh, what's going on, how am I paying these taxes and all of those things. So it's, it's, it's just a, it's a, com it's a combination of different sectors, different units of the government working hand in hand with the CBN governor and ensuring that things are, are in place. Same question to you, Gospel. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Like I said, uh, the CBN governor, Godwin Emefiele, has gotten a lot of blame for this, you know. Some people say he's over-regulating the Naira. He's overdoing, his hands are a little too hard on, on trying to, you know, have an influence on what the, what the Naira is, uh, stands for. Is it really all on him? Like I said, if he goes away today and you have someone who has all the policies that Nigerians want to have, does that change anything? I honestly think that the central bank is overstressed. I think the central bank is focusing too much on areas and sectors and initiatives that it has the primary concern in. 
And that's also happening because in a sane economy, quote unquote, you should have the fiscal authorities in this place. You, call, you talk about the federal government, you know, the key federal government guys, and then the monetary authorities, all right, coming together to make the economy work. Now, in cases where you do not have the fiscal policies or the fiscal authorities doing their bit of the story, right, there'll be a lot more pressure or on the monetary bit of things to sort of like overregulate and you know manage for the excesses of the fiscal space. And also to, to, to say that you've also seen a long track record of fiscal indiscipline, you know, and we're not seizing the opportunities and the moment that you know several times are presented to us. So in this case, the central bank has found itself diving into realm sectors, initiatives, and policy programs that it shouldn't primarily. And as a result of things, they are, they are exhausted and, and they are stressed beyond limits. Now, in the context of doing those things, you don't expect a rational institution to begin to make, in quote and unquote, rational decisions in this context, all right? That's why you see a lot of policy firefighting and some form of policies, using policies to solve structural problems. It doesn't have, happen anywhere in the world. You need structural solutions to structural problems, then you use policies to enable some form of sustainability around you know, the key results you scale from those um, structural fixing and all that. And also to state that there, there are many other leakages in this context that would enable all right, um, the central bank do its work properly. You talk about the civil service, you talk about the MDAs and all of that. So technically, you need a, a proper functioning economy. Now, it's also important for me to say that you cannot have a proper balance between the fiscal and monetary space. All right, there will be compromises. But the compromises should be healthy enough such that the average Nigerian is at the center of that growth and developmental plan. In this case, we do not see any of that, all right? And we expect that going forward, there'll be more synchronate between the fiscal and monetary policies. There'll be much more responsibility for governance and public leadership will be in view of improving human capital and productivity. Until that, until human capital and productivity is happening in terms of the Nigerian economy powering up and there's a form of strategic markets growth and development for competitive, competitiveness, non all exports and all that, there would be no fundamental and strategic growth development in Nigeria, regardless of even if the GDP growth in Nigeria hits 10%. I think we are bothered heavily on the wrong numbers for the wrong reasons. We need to be focused on the right things for the right reasons. All right, very quickly now, I mean, we, we did hear, uh, see reports that he had bought, or people had bought the form for him for, for to run for president, <laughs> so that if part of the APC, which he has not necessarily denied, but uh, yeah. I, I don't know what his situation is, to be honest. But on the other hand, I mean, I think he still has about three years in office if he doesn't run yeah. for president, because it's sort of a fixed tenure uh, to be CBN governor, yeah. unless whatever else happens. What should Godwin Emefiele be doing going forward? What should he do? differently. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of the things we're talking about here seem at least medium to long term. Are there any short term conversations that we should be having now to stem what looks like a disaster waiting to happen? Well, to be honest with you, it's going to be a disaster that would happen if things continue like this. The reason is simply because I mean, in no rational society would you find such act, quite honestly. But then again, every individual has a right to run for presidency. However, that position sort of like um, puts him in a conflict of interest, you know, position in the sense. You are primarily responsible for the direction of spending, for the direction of price stability, for the direction of liquidity in the economy. Knowing fully well that in a pre-election season, all right, all right, monetary policies do not go in a linear form, meaning that we are going to see a lot of cash flow and a lot of spending of the dollar in the Nigerian economy. And that's because by, by virtue of elections, and uh, events and activities are always on the rise, all right? And liquidity will go to sectors that favor those angles. Now, the brain behind the direction of liquidity and price stability is the central bank. And the brain behind that is the central bank governor. All right, so it looks as though, you know, um, that situation is a conflict of interest. And in all honesty, if we have to go by the necessary order of things, that shouldn't okay. be happening in the first place. Now that it has happened, it's meant to step down, you know, in such a way that individuals with, with proper unbiased or objective view of doing things okay. can step into the mix. If Nigeria continues like this, I do not think there will be any form of progress going forward strategically for the nation. Very quickly, Sheno, are you worried? Well... Um, the election is coming, and I just hope that um, um, we are able to. Um, leadership is one problem that we have, so I hope I hope we're able to kind of um, get the right leadership, steer us in the right direction, and change the the destiny of this country. So, I mean, um, right now, one thing that is very critical is the fact that we've not been so concrete about particular 
candidates for, for these two major parties that we have in Nigeria. So, you know, we are hoping that um, we will get them and we hope that they have the right vision to really, really take us to, to the promised land and change the, the worsening situations we have right now. Shehuni Dohu, Gospel of Bele, thank you very much for joining us. We're all for keeping our fingers crossed because whether you spend the dollar or not, everybody's feeling the effects yeah. of what's happening with the Naira. Thanks for being here today. We'll take another break and be right back. Please stay with us. Welcome back now. We're going to go back to the 2023 elections. Now, before the last uh, elections in 2019, the not too young to run, um, bill was signed into law and it was a big conversation then about how young people were going to get involved in politics you know a lot of the ages of a lot of uh, eligibility to run for office was lowered uh and we thought that by these elections we'll be hearing conversations about you know younger people being very active but i'm not sure what's really happening there but i have a guest here with me Dakwa Adaramewa, who's uh probably more conversant <laughs> about this thanks for being here today thank you for have you noticed a change at all in in interest in politics since 2019 with young definitely. people definitely a lot of young people are actually stepping up and trying to but you know a lot of them are met with quite a long number of challenges as you yeah. can imagine the biggest one being finances is is always a big problem because a lot of people don't realize like the average election to run is quite expensive you know if i was running for say house of rep now i could expect to spend between 50 to 100 million to have a very or more depending on the constituency more, exactly depending <laughs> on your constituency exactly depending on your constituency so it's, it's a huge expense for young people who who are trying to you know actually make a difference in their country so those are the main challenges that we're facing right now so i mean the, the what you call young people you know for a lot of people the definitions are, are quite diverse mm -hmm. I, I saw a conversation on twitter today about a presidential candidate who was even called young and i found that very interesting considering his age so but for a lot of young people or the youth they wonder is someone over 40 for example running for house of reps would you consider that young would you consider that person a beneficiary of young people being you know giving this opportunity is that what you mean by young Young people are more active. Are you talking about 20, 30 year olds? Are you talking about 40 year old people who, for some people, might not necessarily be young? I think the, the, the <laughs> problem that we have is um, the age is so high, typically in politics, that yes. all of a sudden a 40 year old looks like a, a young man, a, baby. Like a teenager all of yeah. a sudden, you know? Um, but I, 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 don't, I don't want to be harsh in terms of putting a cut of data as to yes. who is younger, who is not, not um, who is old. Um, so I wouldn't really, I wouldn't be able yeah. to tell. How do we have this money conversation, though? Because it seems to come up every single time. Yes. Okay, the age is, was never the problem. Mm -hmm. Now it seems like the money is the, was the real issue all this while, not necessarily age. Yeah. You know, there's also the other conversation about, you know, the politicians who've been there for a while, the establishment, mm -hmm. quote-unquote, letting you in, whatever that means, you know. Is this money conversation ever going to be something we can legislate, where maybe campaign finance is, is a cap as to what you can spend and stuff like that? Do you think that's ever going to work in a climb like this where who's really checking how much you're spending well i, I think there's already a law that caps my point how exactly much, yeah uh, <laughs> how much you're allowed to spend but when the law is so porous that for example i i might be capped at how much i have to spend but you if you wanted to sponsor my campaign aren't really capped and a lot of the things that you can buy you can contribute all my materials and that's not counted towards how much I'm spending, do you understand? So it's a very difficult one, the money conversation, but I think what young people uh, need to understand is that politics is a very, it's a very broad game, you know, and you don't have to just go straight in, you know, at the point where the point of entry is 50 million euro to get in. Yeah. You can get involved in grassroots politics and it's very cheap. Yeah. The people at the grassroots, they literally get so little of this money that's going around that you can actually make an impact, you can get them to believe in you, and that's where you work your way into the system, right? I see no reason why young people shouldn't pour themselves into a political party. I know you don't agree with that political party. I don't agree with many of the political parties, but I'm still a member and I perform because I know the only way I can make a difference is by being involved, by, by being there, by being part of the delegates. Now, now imagine among the delegates that are going to decide, you know, which, part, which candidate is going to come out in the major parties. Imagine 50% of them were young people with yes. a forward-thinking ideology. Imagine, now, to be a delegate of a party, it's not, it's not too complicated. You don't need to pay 50 million to become a delegate. You just need to take part in the party process. Yeah. So that's where people need to focus on their energy. What you can do where you are is where you should spend your energy and time and not worry about the 50 million. All those things will come eventually. Do you, do you find that young people 
have been excited by young people running for office so far. Um, I think that there's a particular candidate who's in his 40s, I believe, not in any of the major parties, but he was one of the first to declare that he was going to run for, for president. Mm -hmm. There was a bit of, you know, noise about it, but it looks like that has fizzled out, you know, but you, people always thought, oh, if a young person comes out, everybody's going to flood behind this person. Have you seen that young people actually support young people? I think... Uh... Young people would like to, but the, the issue with people is they like to bet on a winning horse. Yeah. Now, we saw young people really engage during the NSAS process. And why was that? Because there was an atmosphere of hope where they felt like we, we can make a difference. That's where they came out, they organized. But when, when they're looking at it and think, oh, this candidate has no chance, they feel like, oh, what's the point? Yeah. But people need to understand that you need to give it your best, right? There's no guarantees. That's, that's the whole idea of democracy, right? It, it's not a walk in the park. It's not something you can observe from outside and just criticize and discuss. Yeah. You must be there. You must push yourself in it and support people however you can. You know, it's, it's a very challenging thing to run. Very for. challenging. You talk about support there, and I want to talk about crowdfunding. And everybody, whenever this crowdfunding conversation comes up, everybody seems to talk about President Obama, mm -hmm. which is a completely different climb. Yes. But it was heavily backed by young people who mm -hmm. threw in whether it was $5, $10, yeah. and we saw the results. I mean, he ended up being president. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's viable here? And does it take just being a young person, or if you want to run for office as a young person, how do you go about the messaging, for example, to let people under, young people understand that this is actually possible if everybody tries to pitch in to this cause, uh, you know, but make it a collective? Yeah, I think um, in terms of crowdfunding, it is possible in Nigeria. I mean, Nigerians are not adverse to giving money to support a particular cause. It's just. It seems that politics is the one area. They, I mean, people, we talk about Big Brother a lot, you know, when you're talking about politics. People engage in that. They organize support groups. They create WhatsApp groups. You know, all of those kind of things. So it's just about taking that energy and that and moving it towards politics. And I think that when young people see a candidate that they can believe in and they actually know that this person has something to offer them, particularly if that candidate comes from a party which they feel, okay, this party has a chance, I think they will. We yeah. just need to change the color, culture, change the narrative around it. It's, they're not begging for money. They're, they're, they're trying to do something to contribute back to society and that's the very least we can do. Uh, it's not much. 5,000 here is... Yeah, something. but it supports only financial if you're trying to support a candidate. What what kinds of things do you could you do, for example, to support a young person even if you're not trying to offer money? Okay. Because we're hearing conversations about volunteerism, but I wonder, does that really have an effect? It does, definitely, without a doubt. Having people in different local government, there's a, there's a young person actually running for governor of Lagos State. Um, he's trying to, and people like that, they need networks around different areas around the state. So people can volunteer, you can definitely put a lot of energy into that, and then also just sharing things on social media and again if you cannot if you cannot give funds yourself you can also help the candidate to raise funds but most importantly the best thing you can do is be in that political party and make sure that your candidate emerges you know do whatever it takes to make sure by the next election you are a voting delegate and you can pick somebody and you can just back that person up by changing the system itself yeah I think do you think we're going to have a change after these elections with, you know, the psyche of how young people view politics. Because I always go back to the Anambra elections with the apathy that came with it, even though there was an insecurity situation going on in the state. You know, you talk to a lot of young people, they are like, mm, my vote doesn't count. Do you think that's where it's leaning to, where there's more young people who don't care, or there's more people who care, or who will care after this? Well, I, I'm worried, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Yeah. But I, I think the, the argument I always give people is that I, I understand that there's this feeling of hopelessness, right? Uh, what's the point? Why try? But that in itself is what kills the process, right? Somebody has told you this story that uh, your vote doesn't count, voting doesn't work, but yet that same person is also the one paying people to vote. Is also the one trying to prevent you from voting. Like, if you really didn't count, people wouldn't be that interested in it. So people need to just get over this idea that, you know, it's hopeless. Because, you know, the UK, the US is not big enough for all of us. Yeah. That's the truth. Not everybody can get away. Somebody will be here. If you get away and you make it out, good for you. But what happens to your cousin? Yeah. What happens to, you know, your distant cousin? All these they're people just like you. They want to have a good life. So why right. don't we just pour ourselves into our country and see what we can make of it? Well, thank you very much, Dakwa. It's going to thank be a very long couple of months ahead of us. We're going to be watching that very closely. And good luck, of course, to all young people who are running for office. There's a few primaries, like I said, holding today already. So mm -hmm. all the best to everyone who's running for office. Well, that's our show for today. Remember, you can follow the conversation on Twitter. Please use the hashtag RobinMinds.